this is now a few days after the Tesla Q3 earnings call. And despite Tesla hitting record revenues of $21.5 billion, but because it was short of estimates, we saw the stock get hammered by 6% the day after. For many of us bulls, actually, we considered the call to be epic. We heard them reiterate growth by 50%. We heard them reiterate the progress of the factories, semi, the Cybertruck, and a whole host of other positives. But somehow, there's still a disconnect. So today, I asked Lee to join us. Lee runs a YouTube channel called Tesla Economist. And what is unique about him is that he actually has this great blend of detailed analysis and forecasts, along with spot-on insights and commentary. So welcome, Lee. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you need to help me get brighter. We need to better understand how we should be thinking of things. So let's get started and tell me what was your biggest highlights that you heard at the call yesterday? Right, yeah, well, I think one of the highlights was the 1,000 gigawatt hours a year production potential yeah. for the US. Um, those numbers are enormous. And we think about the, the current Texas line might have about 100 gigawatt hours and what that means for the company, which is huge as well. But to have 10 times that, 1,000, is, is just crazy. But then when you factor in, the, they're also talking about this new compact or robotaxi, however you want to infer it, that's going to be half the cost and half the, twice the production speed of Model 3, then you're likely going to have a battery of around 40 to 45 kilowatt hours, which would mean that a thousand gigawatt hours would make maybe 20 million of these cars. Obviously, some of those batteries would go into Cybertruck and Semi-Truck and the Model Ys, but either way, I can't, and, and energy as well. We don't know how much energy is going to be used for these with these sales. But either way, you've got to have like 10 million units or so of these compact or, or robotaxis just in the US. But uh, talk about energy. So these cells could just be for vehicles because they are likely to be 4680 if they're ramped up that much. And it's going to be using the probably nickel cells to do it, which is what they currently have in the current chemistry for the 4680s. So it, they haven't, and they've talked about LFP would not be a 4680 uh, chemistry, which means LFP is most likely going to be used in energy. So these cells should just be for vehicles. And also it's going to be fully vertically integrated. And they go mm. into the details saying it's the anode, the cathode, and the lithium refining, which they have discussed already about the lithium refinery in Texas. On top of that, they have in the past talked about lithium mining in Nevada and how Nevada alone could supply enough lithium to replace the entire US fleet to electric. So the vertical integration from the mining to producing the cathodes and the anodes, the cells, the batteries, the vehicles is, is just mind blowing really, especially when you talk about a thousand gigawatt hours a year. It, it's just amazing really. That, that was is probably this... one of the biggest highlights here. Yeah, yeah. Is this the first time that they actually mentioned the thousand gigawatt per hour target? And how should I be thinking of this? Is this something that is going to happen within this decade, just like they, when they say 20 million cars by 2030? Or what What was your take of that? So the biggest target we've had before was the three terawatt hours a year, probably by about 2030 from battery day. So we haven't had an individual US target before. So this was the first time that was mentioned. And as for target, like, we, we pretty much have about 100 gigawatt hours we're expecting in Texas, four 25 gigawatt hour lines there. So it would be just 10 times as many as that. And we, we know how, we've seen how quickly they can set up these 4680 lines. So it would just be a matter of rinse and repeat as soon as they perfected this mm -hmm. production line, which I, I mean, the battery factories don't need to be particularly big, nothing like the size we had Giga Nevada. Um, and we've seen the size of the battery factory in Berlin. It shouldn't take that long to build and the lines wouldn't take that long. So I, I don't know how quickly they can rinse and repeat these factories, but you know, we, I've, it could be five years or maybe, maybe 2030, but it feels like earlier than that, to be honest. Were you happy with when you heard about the 4680 progress? Um, they did say 300% 
growth year over year, that thousand cars per week is now getting the Ford X680s. Is that something that you are excited about? Or, you know, at the end of the day, they said that it's actually not going to be using a semi at all. So it's, and, but then they also reiterate that, um, that they still feel positive about this not being a limiting factor for the Cybertruck. What was your thoughts on 4680 progress? Yeah, I mean, they got three times production, quarter over quarter. Uh, but when you start on a low production rate, you do get obviously yeah. high multiples of increase, in, especially when it's exponential. But the right. fact moving forward, they're saying it is still going to be very exponential in growth. Um, so we, we, we are hoping um, I, I felt positive about about where it's headed. I mean, if, even if it's not going to be to the level we hoped by Q, in Q2, like that we the high volume production that we were expecting this quarter, it's still amazing just as they can achieve it, in my opinion. Um, and as for semi-truck, I think uh, that the 2170s will be used for now, but just as a placeholder in the meantime. And eventually, I think they have to go to 4680s because they won't, they won't be enough 2170 sales. Plus, when you're using maybe 800, 900 kilowatt hours of sales, that's a lot of money. It costs a fortune if 2170 sales and they're like eighty, ninety thousand $90,000, maybe $100,000. It's, it's going to be harder to make a profit. But the 4680 sales, it, it, Elon said, they're going to be $70 per kilowatt hour. Plus there's all those subsidies on top of that, which would take it down to $35 a kilowatt hour, meaning the semi-truck would be very profitable when, when finally they've ramped up 4680s enough, you know? And I, I don't know where they're going to be making, I mean, they said they're going to make the semi-truck in, in, in King Nevada, I think, but I mean, 50,000 units by 2024, there's going to have to be a new factory, surely, right? Because <laughs> it's a big, a big car to make, a big truck to make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm really excited and happy that you said when I asked you what's the highlight of future earnings, you went right to the batteries. It, it makes me remind myself that that really is the kind of the beginnings, the core. They need to have cool. batteries and energy for every growth of any product line, <laughs> energy, sustainable energy. They need to figure this out. That's why they're building the refineries. If they need to go vertically integrated, they will. This is their biggest potential bottleneck for growth. If they can't produce enough batteries, none of these matter. So it's a good reminder. Thank you for that. Mm. Yeah, you, you said the cool, core cool product. It, it is the batteries. Even the robot needs batteries, you know? Uh, so <laughs> right. every, everything needs batteries almost. But the thing is, the, the, the manufacturing they can do just reduces all the costs so much. And then all the yeah. software and AI they do means that these batteries are suddenly so much more valuable when they're in, in a robo taxi compared to yeah. just an EV. And, you know, it says replace five as, five times as many cars. Oh, each robo taxi replaces five right. cars because they're doing five people's driving, you know? Uh, I mean, that makes it essentially five times more valuable per mile compared to any other car, which is yeah. just how this, how they continue to add more and more value onto their products with the software despite all this incredible manufacturing reducing the cost initially. So even if FSD is $15,000, then that's $15,000 almost pure profit per every everyone who orders that. And you know, no one else is, is no one other competitors have, have $15,000 extra software that is pure profit like that. Okay, let's back up. Uh, I want to talk about more about these products and all the things we heard about uh, the technology, but I think what many people are really focusing on is the outlook for Q4 and 2023. So we, you know, heard Elon say, I can't hmm. emphasize enough. We have excellent demand for Q4. We expect to sell every car that we hmm. make in the future. We heard him say, we are looking forward to a record breaking fourth quarter. It looks like we will have an epic end of the year. Zach and Elon both still guided for an average of 50% growth over the next several years. And then Zach said for Q4, he expects 50% growth in production, but just under 50% for uh, deliveries. And yet some people feel like they ducked the question, is there softening in China demand? What was your take on this? And uh, what's your estimates for Q4? Yeah, I mean, 2023? epic Q4 sounds sounds pretty epic. <laughs> so that was, that was a good description. Um, I mean, I've been I've been guessing around probably four fifty to four seventy thousand. Still, I, I know you yeah. kind of land higher than everyone else did, right? For my for my estimates for for the earnings, or for yeah, um, but um, you've we've got 
you know, there's like 30,000 vehicles in inventory now on top of that. And yeah. historically, they've always pushed Q4 the hardest. Q4 is the biggest selling month in the entire auto industry on top of that. Um, and, you know, uh, the, that delay they had uh, with the deliveries in Q2, mm -hmm. uh, Q3, sorry, was, was it's a one-off, you know, it, it's, that's, that's only a one-off. It's like, okay, we're, we're 22,000 short this quarter because we don't want to push logistics at these peak prices. And, but that 22,000 is now going to be delivered in Q4 instead. So that, that delay is just a one-off delay for them to cut these costs. And next time it won't, it won't be as high, even if, if they do do that sort of delay, because, um, there's no point pushing them anymore. And if, especially if it costs that much more, but Q4, I, I feel they are going to push because it's the end of yeah. the end of the year and yeah, but, and then that 50% growth is for what he said for the foreseeable future. So I mean, how, how far are we, are we foreseeing the future the, up to 2030 perhaps? And again, we, <laughs> if the numbers go, do get nutty and we go surpass 20 million quite quickly. I think you get up to like 40 million or something like that by 2030, which again is more in line with this 1000 gigawatt hours a year number. So who knows, maybe, maybe they're not capping at 20 million. <laughs> Right, right, right. Okay. And then, so do you think that he ducked the question though, when he didn't answer the question of whether or not, how are they going to address the uh, Chinese um, credits and some, uh, the consumers there might push the softening of China. He did say that there was a recession there mm. or, you know, the, the yeah, the, what's your, did you think that, uh, or, or even the U.S., that there might be softening demand because of uh, people pushing off until the regulatory, or uh, the IRA mm. credits come in play yeah. too? Yeah. I mean, um, if, if I was going to buy a Model Y in America, I, yeah. I personally probably would push off, uh, push it off a bit later and save six and a half thousand dollars. It, it makes sense, right? It's just human psychology. It makes sense to save a lot of money. Um, but however, some of these orders may have been at the $60,000 price point. And so essentially they're going to be sell saving $500 and have to wait maybe six or probably maybe even 12 months. Uh, who knows what demand is going to be like in the US when this six and a half thousand dollar credit kicks in? It, it could, well, obviously it's going to increase. Everyone's going to want one. Everyone's going to want their discount. And um, and as for China, yeah, sure. I mean, it's been talked about. There's there's a recession in China and just the, the property property market is, was in a bubble and it's likely to crash or, or crash worse. Uh, definitely, definitely a concern, sure. Um, but but I think there's too much of a label about Tesla being a high-end luxury SUV, mm -hmm. which seems to have been conditioned with it. And I've been doing some price comparisons with the competitors, even right. even in Berlin or uh, in Germany. So you can compare these exported or imported to Germany, uh, Shanghai Model Ys, with the local price. And so you've got a, a Volkswagen Tiguan, for example, a similar similar crossover SUV style car. And you know you add in a few of the options that come standard with a Tesla. And you're at the same price point. Uh, and then Tesla have had to pay tariffs uh, on top of that and all the shipping costs, and they're still at that price point and they're still hitting this 30 30 percent margin. Then you could look at a BMW X3, which might be of a similar similar class, you might call it. And it has more standard options, but still nothing close to the Tesla. But even standard, the BMW X3 mm -hmm. in Germany is about the same price as the Model Y, and they both get about the same amount of range too, even though one's ice. And, um, and then you add the options in and, and the BMW is like 10,000 10, euros more. So I, 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 I don't really classify it as a high end luxury SUV, mm. but th at the same time, there, th there is only so many people who, who still want to buy anything at a certain price point every, every quarter, every month. And in China, maybe, maybe, maybe we are about at the limit, about 40, 50,000 units a month with, with model three and model Y combined perhaps. And, um, <clears throat> But then the, there's plenty of demand in Europe, right? The waiting lists there for like six months some, in some nations. So how do you get them to Europe is the issue with the, the yeah. shipping logistics now we're, we're hearing. It's like they can make all these vehicles and there is the demand for them, but they can't get them to all the customers as easily due to logistics now. We've still, you know, supply chain issues we're still suffering from. So that might be a bit of a bottleneck there. So they need to, therefore they they perhaps need to help uh, domestic demand in, in, in China from the Shanghai models. And they were trying to do that with the uh, 8,000 yuan uh, insurance discount. 
Right. When, and that's, I think, it's 7,000 yuan now, and it's extended to the rest of the year. So perhaps that is somewhat of an incentive. But at the same time, there is a, a rhetoric of, of Tesla will reduce prices. And again, like mm -hmm. we were saying, in the US, if you're going to get this $6,500 discount, you would delay your purchase. And if people in China are thinking it's going to drop by $2,000 equivalent, then you know they, they aren't necessarily that desperate to buy it and willing to wait to find out if the price drops, which it may or may not. It, it doesn't sound like it will. Um, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. We'll, we'll have to see. But that's the thing. They, they can drop the price. It doesn't even, it's not even that big a deal. And we're at, I think, uh, 316,000 yuan now for the Model Y. And if they drop it 17,000 yuan, you're at 299, which means it also qualifies for another 11,000 yuan subsidy. So you drop the price by that fraction more and it becomes yeah. that much cheaper again. And then all those people who were waiting will suddenly jump in and, and buy it. Yeah. And it used to be 267,000 yuan, I think, before, and they've raised the prices since then. So yeah. they can, yes. and, <laughs> yeah. Just Plus they just ran where they had it. Yeah, yeah. They, they, it's not like a big deal in my opinion. And I, I think I did the numbers and maybe worst case scenario that it makes 200 million uh, net earnings in the quarter. And it, we're gonna be like about 6 billion anyway. So 200 million, that's not a big deal. Does the price, the stock price doesn't need to drop 10% for that. So yeah. um, it, it, it's, it's not. I think they, they can they can find the find the demand again if necessary with price adjustments. Yeah. yeah well, that was very very reassuring. Not only, you know when you hear Elon say there's going to be an epic Q4, we might discount a little <laughs> bit of that you know he's pumping it a bit. But when Zach says you know that we are still guiding for fifty percent growth uh, in production, maybe just under for deliveries, it makes mm. me feel good. I love to hear that. Yeah. And then they did say about the, uh, Elon said about re recession resilient. So you spoke about that too. And so what's your take on this? I mean, uh, the world is going crazy. There's going to be a recession next year. It could be a, it could be a soft landing or it could be a hard <laughs> crash. Yeah. Well, um, the, but in the, yeah. The global financial crisis, I think US auto sales dropped about 30% from 17 yeah. million to 11 million or so a year. So, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a reasonable job, but that's overall auto sales. That obviously includes internal combustion, right? But yeah. so meanwhile, we also have EVs increasing in market share relatively. Right. So it, it, it might mean that, okay, maybe overall auto sales drop 30%, but uh, EVs are still increasing in, in, cause it's been supply limited. It's not, it's not that people haven't been uh, mm -hmm. wanting to buy EVs. It's that they can't make enough. And so, that might that might be it might be fine Offset. in that sense. I think I, think yeah, that's, I love that it. Speaks yeah. itself. Uh, it's a growing industry, you know. Um, perhaps cell phone sales dropped then as well, but the uh, smartphone sales increased. Mm. Um, App Apple was doing well out of that. And uh, as for as for the economy, it, it's it's really tough to tell what's going on. I, I I'm of the theory that the the Fed can't can't afford to keep the rates this high. Uh, and other other reserve mm. banks either they they're going to suffer uh, for the Fed. It's going to be tough for the government to to roll over their their treasury bonds again at these high rates. And before they didn't have enough government income for all their spending uh, at zero percent interest. So how they can at four and a half percent or something is beyond me. So I think I think eventually it has to pivot. Same and we were seeing you know similar which which actually is an issue for their bonds as well. If people think more inflation is coming then you don't want to lock in a 10-year treasury bond at you know 4.5% either if you think 20 or 30 or 40% inflation might be on the way, which is kind of what we're seeing in the UK and the Bank of England having this issue with over there. And But uh, as for other nations, they may not have as much national debt, but they have more um, debt for the citizens and their mortgages and things. They have higher, higher debt on the personal debt. So they can't afford to or lose their houses. So I think... All reserve banks have to eventually pivot because these aren't sustainable high rates. The world is used to, to debt. We're a debt-based society, but this only works with lower rates. Otherwise, it, it, mm -hmm. no one can afford it and everything goes, everyone goes bankrupt. So eventually they have to pivot. And I think this inflation is inevitable to come one, one way or another. We, um, you, you, can't, you just can't print this much money without re repercussions. You know, it's, it's so much more. Was it 40% of US dollars are in circulation that were printed in the last two years or something ridiculous, right? Right. I mean, you you can't just you can't just stop that, you know. And there's even an argument. Okay, a lot of this, a lot of the high rates are based on this whole theory of how how Vol Paul Volcker in uh, the '80s, early '80s, stopped inflation by raising rates to like 20, percent okay. and it, it we put us into a recession. 
and and it, it reversed but that's uh it's axiomatic that that might happen again because there's other ways other theories that people have as well it's like well rising interest rates also increase the cost of business as well and therefore they have to pass these costs on to the consumer and therefore they have to charge higher prices because of the higher rates so i mean it, it's tough to tell what's going to happen and I, I don't believe necessarily that high interest rates do prevent inflation it, it might be holding it off a little bit and crashing the economy here uh, crashing well, breaking a few things in the economy but i think if it is mm. going to actually stop inflation you would have it would have to have a serious recession which which is going to be even worse because um you, it, you're in a deflationary mode then which is much harder to get out than an inflationary mode okay. and it's worse for the economy <laughs> so okay, okay sorry well, i might, might have gone on a bit there <laughs> well, no that's great i mean obviously this is the big topic the uh, macro <clears> is the <throat> absolute topic so we need to better understand what's going to happen um and I think you said a few things that it may be a positive, right? Which is at some point they need to pivot. Um, and that there are levers that Tesla can do. What's your thought on this idea that Berlin and Austin are now ramping quite significantly? And in fact, I love I loved the fact that they mentioned that at this time, even now already in Q3, they, they're already at positive uh, profitability. And while it weighed on the lowered margin this year, this quarter, it will still weigh under Q4, but less so. And that he, they said that uh, they they would have hit 30% gross margin, uh, mm. excluding regulatory credits, if you remove Berlin and Austin. Mm. And so in as we go on for this quarter four, but also 2023, the Berlin and Austin is going to ramp up. So that should make everything less cost, less less impact the margin. And if it's a great margin, they can then reduce price. They can do all sorts of things if they wanted to. So I, I really appreciate it that Elon said, you know, it was recession resilient. Uh, we needed to hear that as bulls because many of us has been saying this, but I mm -hmm. thought it was a good thing that they said yeah. that. So. Yeah. So did they, they didn't say profitability in uh, in Texas though. It's just Berlin so far. Is, is, that was my my. Belief. I heard. I heard. Well, I got. I wrote it down specifically. <laughs> okay, great. And I think the words were Zach said that the gross margin already positive. In both uh, factories. On both factories. Wow. Uh, Two thousand okay. cars per week, and then that they was, said that, that was four Q three, or just by now it is Q Q three. That, okay, wow. that in Berlin's for sure already at 2,000 cars per week, and that Texas in the last day or two, if it if it continues on this way, they're basically practically at 2,000 cars per week as well. Yeah. They're going to get there really soon. And this is only, I think they said 5% design capacity. I, I don't know if it was the word design, but, it, right. you know, the 5% of because... capacity still so. Because, um, yeah, it was great that they also said we're at almost 30% gross margin without regulatory credits and without Berlin and Austin. <laughs> and if it was 27.9% without them, then that would mean that they're bringing down the margin 2.1%. But, yeah, so if if they do have, uh, depending on the proportion of cars that they're making there, then it's it's going to be it's going to be very low margin either way. So I think they are they're obviously hurting margin a lot because that's a they're not making many cars and for it to bring down yeah. from thirty percent to oh so it's twenty seven point nine percent with regulatory credits so without regulatory credits I'll, I'll, I'll work this out sometime actually because I want to know now <laughs> but I think I could probably estimate what the margin is from those factories with that data uh, that'd be interesting but yeah I mean here in Texas is on two thousand uh, well it, almost on two thousand a week almost. now yeah yeah that was reassuring I didn't expect that. And um, and Berlin seems to be quite confidently there. And we, we were hearing that it was going to be volume production by the end of this year, and now the start of next year for Berlin. Which I'm not sure they didn't they didn't mention that anymore. There was no how they'll what the rate of these factories would be at the end of the quarter or start of next quarter. No one asked that or no one said that. But we'd assume that Austin, if Austin's almost at two thousand, then it's probably not too far away from Berlin. And perhaps they are close to volume production or hit volume production in Q1 potentially. But I'd say they are running, starting to run short on that 2170 supply eventually. And if they still think that this is happening, then maybe the 4680s should be there to supplement them. Well, for sure, for, for Cybertruck, 
And by mid-year, it sounds like it's going to be, they think it's going to be in scale production by mid-year next year. So if you think about it, it's actually a really good year to have a recession. <laughs> <laughs> Happier that it happened 2023 rather than 2022, because, right, you've got Gigafactory Berlin and, and Austin already ramped up by 2023. You're going to have the... Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act happening mm -hmm. by January Jeez. of this year. Uh, they've they've already worked. They've been spending so much many years on on the Giga castings and working things out in factories. And so they the cars have been designed. Cybertruck and Semi. They already spent the time for that, and they're both rolling out this year. So. 2023. I mean, you know, what I mean, it's like a great year to help. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, to weather but, a recession, <clears throat> and then they're bolstering their cash. I wanted to ask you about financials next. So you were going to say something? Well, yeah. Also, in the earnings report, they said that they will have uh, structural battery packs, front and rear castings in Berlin okay. uh, this year, which would mean 4680 sales, which I haven't really heard anyone talk about this. It, it was in there in the report. Um, mm -hmm. So that if, if that's true, then that means they possibly have 4680 sales in production in Berlin this year. Which uh, the the narrative really is that they've kind of stopped Berlin forty six eighty production and moved it over to Texas, but that's not what it said in the report. So uh, it's yeah, that's that was promising. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I mean, I think they said there's a thousand cars per week that has forty six eighty, right? So it's progressing along not as fast as they wanted to, but. I don't think that they feel like it's going to be a rate limiting stack, certainly for the Cybertruck. That was the thing I was waiting for, mm. because if Semi and Cybertruck are still on track and they they reiterated that guidance, uh, that's going to be, you know, somebody told, somebody said this recently, that they thought they considered the Cybertruck to be recession buster. Hmm. Um, Jeff Lutz said this at a Cyber, Cyber Rodeo, uh, Cyber Bulls episode that I just did. Uh, Cybertruck is a recession buster <laughs> because the right the wait list is so massive. People have been waiting for this so long. <laughs> it's what, what's your thought on that? And then so it comes out a new line. If it comes out, let's say in let's say September of next year, and starts yeah. to sell like crazy. I think I think Cybertruck in volume production is the start of the next next run on the stock price. That's kind of the pivotal point. I think that well, people why do you need say that? to see. <laughs> Because um, I think it, a lot of people just, uh, you know, there's a lot of people saying vaporware and all these sorts of things. And it's like, you see this car, no, that's just not something people will make or no one wants to buy that, all these other things. And <laughs> it's just not possible. And then you look at the performance of it as well, uh, like 500 miles of range, not 102.9 seconds for a massive truck. Um, and then the price as well was a reasonable price given what it can do. And then you look at this massive uh, giga casting machine for it. it. It's it's hard for people to just believe and fathom that something like that can be engineered and produced, uh, and to see it in production. I, I feel like it's it's a real step for for Tesla. And also on top of that, they would have to have the forty six eighty production well ramped. And they, and I think that might be <clears throat> what will really uh, bring it home: the forty six eighty production seeing that Cybertruck in volume production and people start seeing them driving around. And eventually that should, in my opinion, start yeah. the next ride for the stock price. I agree with you completely. And that I have <laughs> real world example of why that happened. So I've been a huge uh, Tesla bull and fan for a decade now. And that's all I ever talk about. Tesla, Tesla, Tesla. <laughs> I have two brothers and a sister. They didn't care. They don't, whatever. They didn't care who Tesla was, right? And then finally in 2020, or when the Cybertruck was announced, my brother saw that <laughs> and he not only put in a reservation, <laughs> called me later, I just put in a reservation. I don't know what took what got over me. He then went all in on Tesla because wow. of the Cybertruck. Wow. Uh, and I think in, as soon as, like you said, as soon as they, these things are out in car and being driven around and people see them, it's just going to be exponential in terms of how people see these cars and then want to get in it and then want to then buy the stock, right? It's just going to be... Yeah. Nasty. You you haven't seen one in real life yet? You? Did no, you go? but I, I speak, I've spoken to people who have and they said, yeah. like, seeing it in the photo just doesn't... Like, oh, I'm sorry. Like it looks 10 times... Yeah. I was at, I was at uh, Cyber Rodeo. I did see one. Um, oh, wow. But it was, it was, it was the um, prototype version. 
Mm. And it, I saw little gaps and it, it felt like it was plastic. Like, you know, you're looking at it from a, three feet away, five feet. And I thought, oh, okay, it could look, it could look <laughs> a bit better. But <laughs> yeah, it's like, but some people say it's like CGI in real life almost, right? <laughs> Yeah. Let's back up a bit on financials. And so this was record everything, right? Everything was record. Revenue, cash flow, uh, not, not earnings. Margins. <laughs> okay, sorry, margins weren't, but it's still a huge growth. Um, and so margins was lower. It was still higher than, um, than the estimates, but lower than most of the retail estimates. What do you think was the reason what was the mistake that the well, retail investors made that I, they're typically had, dead on right yeah i mean i i think i had possibly the highest margin out of everyone as estimates yeah. and um my I, I thought i thought the new factories were going to have a higher margin i think that's part of it but also my other theory is that um all the line upgrades in shanghai we saw well none of them were in restructuring or, and they cut that would have cost quite a lot so it all must have been in cost of goods sold which means it went into margin. Yeah. And I think I think that's where it went because we yeah. And there was a similar time in the Model S uh, line upgrade. It happened there. It went into cost of goods sold. So and this is obviously a probably a larger line upgrade than the Model S upgrade, and it was for two factories. So I have a theory that the, it, it could have just gone there because I've you know these prices are up around the board about ten percent from Q one. That's that's a huge price jump. And I, I, I researched these quite heavily and I was, I was only off by the average selling price by about 0.8%. Mm -hmm. So I got, I got that right. But I thought because, you know, 10% price increase, a lot of that's got to go to margin, but it, it didn't. Um, so I, my, I had only had 33.3% estimate. Um, so I was way too high. So I'm guessing that uh, it possibly, possibly went in this line upgrade. But I mean, other, other than that, it'd just be inflation. And I don't think there would have been that much inflation since Q1. Um, shipping prices have come down, for example, and, and other prices have come down for other things. Plus this this upgrade in Shanghai also meant that the cost per vehicle there would be lower because they've they got the same factory doing more units. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, I think what I heard was they they blamed it on um, uh, so supply ch so the inflation supply chain and then also the cost of the dollar, the strong dollar. Yeah, that was the other thing, perhaps a, the dollar, but I'm not sure what, what they import in US dollars over there, um, because they wouldn't have affected margins if it's all locally sourced. Sure. But again, what we're talking about is compared to estimates. But if you step mm. back and think about the numbers and what we've hit, this is a very strong balance sheet. I saw a stat that said that of the top 10 uh, market cap companies, uh, Tesla is number three in terms of strength of balance sheet. So the other two is uh, Microsoft and Google are ahead of us, but we're way ahead of everyone else. And so just unbelievable, I think. <clears throat> yeah, especially for a car company. Exactly, <clears throat> a car company. So this is Ford exactly, with like you're comparing 100... the software companies. Exactly. <laughs> Ford's got like $130 billion of debt, I think. Do you, think, a lot. Do you think they're going to die? Do you think um, how many of the ICE cars might not make it through the recession? I, I have a lot of theories on, on how it might play out. I think uh, inevitably the most the most likely chance is that even if the companies themselves go bankrupt, I think that the brands might survive like a, mm -hmm. a Phoenix almost, um, but just as electric. And perhaps they get bought out by some conglomerate or, or LG or someone, a battery company buys out the Ford brand, the Ford battery mm. factories, and the, the Ford electric production factories, perhaps, uh, because there's going to be demand for electric cars, and, and Tesla can't can't make enough. And I know how much we love Teslas, but not everyone actually wants yeah. a Tesla. <laughs> Some people do want something different. I think the ones that have the most chance, though, um, from complete survival would be perhaps Mercedes, Porsche. I think, you know, Porsche is uh, is, is separating themselves from Volkswagen, publicly public company right because they have a brand that people do pay a lot for but the cost of a porsche battery and a porsche motor is is about the same as a ford battery or a ford motor yet people are willing to spend sure. a lot more on the porsche brand meaning that there might be enough for them to actually have a profit in the ev industry and there's such a small small brand uh, or small you know small market that they don't need to sell that many anyway uh, whereas a porsche electric internal combustion motor sorry is costs a lot more than a, a Ford. 
in terms I of combustion. See. Yeah, whereas the batteries, are, it's more a more even playing field. So you need that prestigious brand for people to justify spending more. And if and if you're if you're rich and you you know maybe you don't want a Tesla because everyone else has a Tesla and you want people to know that you're better off and more successful. So you, and even though it's a, it's not as good a car. And it won't drive itself and it's not as luxurious, but you want something different. So you buy a Porsche or a Mercedes or something, you know, and, and also some people want like various different lifestyles and they want their car to be a bit bigger or, or something else, you know, that and the Tesla isn't quite big enough for them. You know, there's, there's, there's plenty of, of reasons for people not to buy Teslas. Okay. But we agree there are probably going to be some <laughs> nice cars going to oh, not yeah. survive. I think, I think GM, GM's in trouble. I, I think, um, Volkswagen probably in trouble too. These these mainstream brands that are kind of you know just floating around as as the the mainstream the mainstream brands because I think Tesla's going to wipe them out. T Toyota people think is going to are going to go out, but I yeah. think they might they might go out slowly because hmm. there's you know we're not we don't have enough electric cars to replace. Meanwhile, Toyota do have a lot of hybrids, yeah. um, and if they make them in the US, they get the uh, they get to benefit from the tax credits as well. So they might not go out as early as people think. I think GM, Volkswagen are probably, or maybe Stellantis too as well. These these yeah. ones are in trouble. Well, they're highly leveraged, right? I think I saw some stat that said seventy five percent debt compared to their twenty five percent, you know, income earnings. So right. it's <clears throat> highly <laughs> yeah. I mean, Ford, under break already. Ford's debt's like three or four times their market cap. I mean, that's just crazy. But they yeah. they have collateral on the on the the cars they've sold. So these are all the uh, the cars that have been financed. Leasing, and yeah. Yeah, so that's the collateral. But if if suddenly no one wants used cars anymore and we're in a recession or something, uh, then they might stop making the payments and then they can't service that debt. And then they lose their um, yeah. their, their rating as well, which which means that they just go out very quickly, go into very quickly. And yeah. it'd be a yard sale. Who wants to buy these assets? Who wants to buy the used car business? Who wants to buy their electric car business? And uh, yeah, maybe you know we'll, we'll have to see what happens. Do you think that uh, it's going to work in Tesla's favor? Let's say if there's a recession, it's a big, deep one. We already are seeing a massive, um, faster than people realize, uh, this destruction of the uh, ICE car business. They're watching their core business, these ICE companies, crumble. Um, and so then, if if people are going to buy an EV. And yet these other companies are struggling, can't even produce EVs, right? They can't even get them out. Then even in recession, <clears throat> the only option is a Tesla if they want to buy an EV. Mm, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, they've got the operating leverage uh, that they suffer from. So economies of scale, right? They, they, for a start, they don't even make any profit hardly on the cars they sell. It's, it's all the aftermarket stuff, um, you know, the services, yeah, the, the service. parts, right? Yeah, and, 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 and the financing. Um, yeah. So they, they don't make any profit as it is. So suddenly, if fewer people are buying their vehicles, then they, they can't they don't, can't also support all these extra factories making these cars. And then they have to close down lines. They have to close down factories. They have to end models that aren't as profitable. And like you're saying, there'll be less supply. But meanwhile, Tesla are increasing their supply. And you know, I, th I think the narrative now is that EVs are the future. I think pretty yeah. much everyone realizes that. And that you, if you're going to spend fifty, sixty, hundred thousand dollars on a car, an internal combustion one, then you, that's a lot of money you're potentially going to lose. So yeah, yeah it, it's 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 tough. But they, I think, legacy have woken up. You know, obviously, and they're spending tens of billions of dollars building these factories because you know they're using old technology and they don't have the best engineers, but they have to do it the way they know how to. So it's not forty six eighty cells factories with dry battery electrodes. It's just the old process, similar to Giga Nevada. So about where Tesla was eight eight years ago or so, um, and and that's what they got to do. Hence, they got to pay these massive prices, build these enormous factories, and still only get a minimal output enough, maybe one or two million cars a year, EVs a year, and then they still have this issue with the car dealer network, which which is really tough. <laughs> right. Oh, sorry, Herbert, you're cutting it, cutting out on me. I can't hear you. Um, oh, there you oh, go. Can, can you, you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah. yeah, great. Did you hear Martin um, say that operating leverage, operating leverage for the win? So Tesla's operating leverage is just amazing. It skyrocketed yeah. up. What's your uh, commentary on that? Yeah, I've been talking about this for some time um, yeah. because essentially their OPEX is 
does not seem to increase very much compared to the revenue and the deliveries and the production. Is this the so, SGA, SGNA being flat quarter to quarter, which is shocking? Yeah, like what? Yeah. How did that happen? Can <laughs> yeah, you explain? And, and the amount the amount of progress they make with such minimal R and D investments as well is just beyond me. But anyway, they do, and uh, it means that as the as the more they ramp up these deliveries and, and production, is that the opex per vehicle cost goes down from like seven thousand dollars to like two thousand dollars when they get to about three million deliveries or so four million deliveries a year uh so that's an extra five thousand dollars profit per vehicle <laughs> it's it's amazing i don't think i don't think many people will realize this or at least wall street doesn't <laughs> okay and then uh so tesla semi you know did you already and so everybody's starting to count in now that they heard the fifty thousand uh number by 2024 i don't mm -hmm. know what that means in 2023 but doesn't that imply 10 billion dollars of revenue if you consider two hundred thousand dollar average sales price for that um yeah. pretty significant <clears throat> that's a lot bigger than i think most of uh, about these analysts have been you know not even adding it as a line item yeah i mean i i was shocked actually uh fifty thousand by 2024 i i I really don't know how they are doing that. Where's, how, where's the factory making them for a start? And then the infra, <laughs> yeah. in, <laughs> and then the Can't infrastructure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How are they going to get all these chargers? They, they, you can't use a supercharger. You got to use you got to use these these <laughs> uh, these semi truck mega chargers. Uh, was it one and a half megawatts or two megawatts? They, mm. they power, um, and they presumably are quite a lot to set up uh, and cost a lot. And they have to be on all the all the popular routes that semi trucks drive, and and possibly they even want them in the, in the facilities where they're unloading them, um, when where the semi truck can charge whilst it's also being unloaded to save time. So that's a big infrastructure to build up for fifty thousand semi trucks, and and I guess it would just like you say, probably Nevada it starts, and and just the the popular routes that that Pepsi use there and, and other brands, Walmart or whatever, and eventually you know they have the infrastructure along the roads there, the highways. And then they build up throughout proliferates throughout the US after that and more routes are there and but um fifty thousand already it, that early, I mean um if they do it, I'm 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 amazed really. It's impressive. They, they must have struck deals already that they haven't announced yet. It's got to be have it's something we don't know. <laughs> something we don't know why they would be confident enough to say fifty thousand semis. Um, and I, is it in a recession? Do you think that manufacturing companies like a Pepsi would be more likely or less likely to buy yeah. a semi? Because I, yeah. I think the savings is two hundred fifty thousand dollars over life of three years. But you know, does it justify their immediate purchase and that you know that first buy? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an amazing return. Even even with higher rates, it's still a good return. And if they've got the capital, then it's obviously justified, especially in a test, in a recession, to save save money um you know what it is yeah they would probably well i was going to say finance it but then the interest is going to be skyrocket high but then they don't have to pay for the you know exorbitant uh, diesel fuel cost which is which is ridiculously expensive each month mm. now they don't have to do that so yeah so, and, and by you know by 2024 we oh sorry it could offset the financing you know yeah i mean but also if we have the self-driving um then <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. I've... Let's talk about let's talk self driving. <laughs> Do you know much about FSD? Because I don't know if you, you cover that much. In, uh... Yeah, I, I I don't cover it because um, I, I like to cover. I like to specialize in in what I know the most, rather than just talk about things for the sake of it. And I can't even get FSD beta here, right? Um, where I am, and there's people testing that relentlessly. So I don't I don't see any point in me trying to just assume how things are and speculate on it. My opinion is just like you know what they're doing i'm looking at what they're doing but i'm not able to experience it personally but the videos i watch it, it's absolutely incredible really do, do you have beta i do have fsd beta um, oh, okay. i joined a year ago in october so the the next the first round when it expanded beyond just a handful of people um and i've been testing it so just i think there's people still still misunderstanding the words that he's using or maybe I am, <laughs> so it could be the other way around. So what I heard him say is that by the end of this year, they're going to offer FSD beta to everyone, okay? And so that just simply means, and he clarified <clears throat> this, that if you bought FSD beta, whether the one-time $15,000 fee or the monthly subscription, you don't need to do the safety score. You can just go online and turn it on or turn it off like a settings. 
Okay. That's what I heard him say. Now, he has also said something like, it's going to, it, if you're driving with FSD beta on, it's already safer than if you don't drive with FSD beta. Okay, that's straightforward. But some people are in, misunderstanding that and thinking that, oh, he's already said that it's safer than a human. And then the analyst's question was, is this level four, level five? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just laughed when he said that. It's like, I, it's clearly you don't understand anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, having said that, Elon still says that, well, it can drive you from, you know, from your home to your work without you putting your hands on the wheel. So you still need to be there. You need still to be sitting on the driver's seat. No one is saying yet that this is robo taxi, but you know, you you don't you know for him to say you don't have to put your hand on the wheels. I mean, you know, come on, you got to be careful with that, right? You still yes. want to be protective of people. To be like a robo taxi at that point, you don't have to be sitting in the driver's seat anymore. But again, that's another statement that I just take as if you know. FSC is going to be ready or Robotaxi is going to be ready next year kind of statement. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, like you say, level four, level five, it, that's the way they're thinking. Yeah. It's just binary. Either it is or it isn't. And then Elon's trying to say, no, think of it more like interventions, a few interventions per mile or, or per, per trip, you know, and then the March of nines, it's just yeah. going to get better and better and better and better as time goes on. It's not like, oh, now it works before it didn't. We've flipped, flipped the switch. We've solved this one thing. And now now it can drive properly. You know, it, it's progressing continually. And um, so, yeah, I, I also inferred from what he was saying that FSD beta is safer than a human driver. That's kind of what I inferred. I know, I know you're saying it was not inferred that way. But also no. on top of that, you've got to remember the ones who do have it are the ones with the higher safety score as well, who are better, who are safer drivers as well, potentially. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but yeah. Beta but if, is always... if you are driving with FSD beta on, you are safer than if you don't drive with it on. That is a clear check right. mark. Yeah, but yeah. For, to, for people to say that FSD beta is safer than a human, they might interpret that to mean that if there's nobody sitting there and it drives on its own, it's already safer than a human. Right. I'm not yeah. sure if we're there <clears throat> yet. Yeah, yeah, because you, you've it's, got the, the interventions. The problem with that statement is that it's already such, such in the autopilot in a highway. That is true. Uh, but it's, you know, you know, I think he, he, like you said, you, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that is the right statement that he does think that, you know, leaving it alone, just let him drive, it's already safer than the somewhere. average human, right? It's like better than the, the worst teenager driving. But at the same time, earlier this year, though, we were told it will be safer than a human. Right. And, you know, we've only got a month and a half left or a couple of months left of the, the year. Uh, so he's so saying it's, it, yeah. it's got to be got to be close to. It's a low bar, than... by the way. Yeah, in order for it to be robot taxi, it has to be like twenty <laughs> times safer than a human, not just like barely safer than a human. So that, yeah, that's again, what Elon yeah. talked about that as well but in the past, and he's like, actually, it, it that's it doesn't it shouldn't have to be twenty times safer. If it is safer than a human, then it it should just be out because it's safer than a human. and It's going to save lives, you know. Yeah, but it's safer than a worst human. You know what I mean? Like you don't yeah, want yeah, sure, that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? But yeah. I was, uh, again, it feels great when you hear him say, I think that RoboTaxi is a 100% likelihood it's mm. going to happen, just a matter yeah. of time. 100%. The robot is 100% likelihood that's going to happen. And then he just said, if we don't know yet, uh, the team has to decide if, if uh, D uh, Dojo is going to be faster and quicker or better than a NVIDIA chip yeah, by next yeah. year or not. <clears throat> But for him to say that robotaxi and you know in his mind, they're already on the way to being solved. That mm. that is great. I mean, like it feels good. <laughs> yeah, if and then saying and being so honest about Dojo as well adds more credibility mm. to this other hundred percent. So yeah, um, that hundred percent robotaxi would be would be crazy. Yeah, yeah. I I, I think it's I think we're there. I think it's going to happen. Um, if you if you see it being able to solve the complex again, it's not solving the complex that term, but you can see huge progress towards it doing better and better and better over time. There's still going to be lots of issues with it, but if for it to learn how to do that, then it can basically learn anything, and it's just a matter of time. Like there's maybe no more of that limiting stuff. Yeah. Um, 
what was your thought on the next generation vehicle? So he had, they had said that this is going to be half the cost, take up half the factory, and it's going to actually be more production of this than all models combined. Mm. I've been saying for quite a while that uh, I don't believe that they're creating a $30,000 or a compact car that they're going to sell to consumers anymore. I think they changed their mind. They're working on a dedicated robo-taxi design. This is what they're talking about, a robo-taxi. And then when Omar did a couple tweets saying, oh, this is now the robo-taxi, he actually liked both those tweets. Yeah, so that. <laughs> so you saw that. What's, what was yeah. your uh, interpretation of that? Yeah, I mean, it, I think either way, we're talking about the same car. If it's the Robo Taxi or if it's a compact, I think it, it's the same platform, a lower cost, faster produced, smaller battery car. And to be honest, it like I think Uber fares are something like 90% are single passenger use. So mm -hmm. if you, there's no point having a Model Y driving single people around all the time. You may as well have a smaller compact with using fewer batteries, but you can make twice as many of them, for example. Um, and yeah, he has also said that Robotaxis will be in volume production in 2024. So there's, there's no other car we're really hearing about yet in volume production before then. So, but then there's also that $25,000 price tag car that we also hope about. So potentially it is the same car, whether it is for sale for the public is a different story. And if they're so valuable. You know, if it's going to produce thirty thousand dollars a year to Tesla, a year, you know, profit on the taxiing, why would they want to sell them to consumers for twenty five thousand dollars? Unless, of course, it comes with no steering wheel, no pedal, and you have to spend uh, maybe five hundred dollars a month on on FSD, perhaps. But still, it's going to be numbers. That they're not. They're going to want to keep as many Robo taxis for themselves as possible, and they're going to be limited by production and sales yeah. to to start with. So potentially it is the robo taxi to begin with, and over time when production and supply starts to meet a robo taxi demand, then they can start selling them to the consumers maybe, perhaps. But yeah, this, this is actually I, I wish someone had asked some questions about this. Really, this is uh, I'm trying to work this all out myself and get my head around it. Uh, it's a shame no one really asked too much about this. Yeah, I the way I I heard him say before, and I'm piecing all the things together, was that when he was at the Giga Factory, uh, Giga Cyber Rodeo, and they announced that they you know the new line item is this dedicated robo taxi design. And it's going to come. The design will come next year, and now he reiterated today, this you know yesterday, that the 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 team, the design team, is all focused on this new platform, yeah. uh, because they've already done the Cybertruck, they've done the Semi. That's out of mm -hmm. the way. <clears throat> and so they're working on this and it's a platform. So it's going to be this, this, you know, small compact car, but it could also be a van. It could be, you know, configurable. Um, so I think, you know, this is what they're working on. <clears throat> yeah. We'll and, put it this uh, way. And okay. I think, yeah. Sorry. Oh, and then, <laughs> then he talked about having fleet managers. And so what they might do is, you know, 80% they'll keep 10, 10% they'll have fleet managers and then another 10 or 5% to consumers. It's right. something like that. Because yeah. you got to manage these cars. You've got to clean them and, and look after them and everything and recharge them, obviously. Yeah. But, okay, so if FSD is is going to be ready and maybe through regulation, at least some states or whatever, perhaps in 2024, then there is no higher value-added product to Tesla than a robo-taxi, right? They can go and make an, an cyber SU, Cybertruck SUV version or whatever and charge $100,000 for that, but... Per, per kilowatt hour of cell deployed, there is nothing more profitable than a robo taxi. So if they have cracked FSD, then it only makes sense to pivot the company all the way uh, to making robo taxis and nothing else in the meantime, because it is that much more profitable. And also on top of that, obviously it does more for the mission if you're replacing five ICE cars at once, especially with only a 40, 45 kilowatt hour battery pack compared to a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack in a Cybertruck. So it is most of the mission and it most profitable. So, so I, I think that is where it's all headed. And this $25,000 Tesla, whatever we want to call it, um, they're going to have to wait for that, I think. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, you know, we have to expand and think about our uh, potential um, markets of how this is going to be rolled out. So I can see suburbs and cities, just like um, Cruise is doing with, you know, 
certain uh, suburbs in Calif in San Francisco. They don't go downtown, but they kind of go around it. So right. can you imagine, like, I'll give you an example, Las Vegas. Yeah. So Las, Las Vegas, Vegas approves uh, robo taxi for certain city limits, and basically they approve it for picking up and dropping off people from <laughs> you know casino to casino. They approve mm. it from casino to your home, but to certain only certain routes that they do it allowed it in. <clears throat> Then it's approved. Now you're going to buy, you know, a thousand cars. Then another city, another city, or maybe a university, right? Or a shopping district or, you know what I mean? Like there are ways that, that you can get approval. Once you prove that it's safer, once automated collision avoidance comes into play and they prove without a doubt that this thing cannot hit anything anymore, uh, at that point, you, 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 it's irresponsible for you to not approve this thing if that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Las Vegas is an obvious place. They've already got the um, the tunnels there, so so they, perhaps that and and you know, going up and down the strip that makes it pretty easy as well. It's it's not hard, and there's so much so many traffic, so much demand there. People wanting to uh, to go from one hotel to another, um, but yeah, I, I I feel like they've got to do test studies as well. But you also need the supply initially too, because you can't wait like half an hour for your taxi. You might as well just get an Uber. So you need the whole infrastructure set up. So perhaps they build all these rubber taxis and they deploy them all to Las Vegas to start with. And then they build some more taxis and they deploy them to another city or, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm excited. But, you know, the statement that this is going to be more sold more than all models combined. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and more half than. the cost to create. Mm -hmm. And twice the speed, potentially. And if it is a robo taxi, the revenue is way more than I don't know. Have you calculated the revenue? But it's like it's that people just keep saying it's nutty. I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's I'm nutty. getting. I'm I'm going to get there. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> crazy. But yeah, so I mean, twice as, as much combined. Um, I mean, we're probably in five five million there at least. But it's probably more like ten million. Let's face it, right? Uh, it's yeah, going to be crazy. Unit to year, I mean. Okay. Well, I, I think we're also dreaming that we think that that's still a dream. <laughs> um, but okay. So what's your thought on his comments about most valuable company bigger than Apple and Saudi Aramco for yeah. $2.3 trillion? <laughs> yeah, I guess um, when, I guess was the question really. But uh, when you factor in that 1000 gigawatt hours a year, uh, it feels like it should be even bigger. <laughs> And like he said, he's been right before about being worth more than Apple, the $700 billion price tag. And we got up to 1.2, I think, at the peak. So like, we've, we, will, we will do these numbers. We all imagine, you know, that whole $10 trillion valuation by 2030 or something. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this wasn't really any surprise to us in a sense, but it was nice to hear Elon say it at the same time. And I think it was more like, okay, sure, before we had all these theories, we had 4680 batteries, we could make all these cells and make all these cars. But now it's like, I feel like maybe the, maybe this was more like Elon saying that we have the path to do it all. We, we've, we've achieved it. We've done it. We've cracked FSD. We've cracked 4680s and all this, you know? And yeah. I think that that might have been more what he was, what he was getting at. Rather than yeah, when he all, said that he didn't that include worth. robots, but that must imply that he included robotaxi. And so clearly with robotaxi, I mean, it's very clear once that comes into place, you know, the stock has to jump. The revenue is just going to be crazy as it grows over the next several years. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like we say, how Cybertruck is possibly a pivotal point for the stock price uh, to, to, to get its next run. Well, Robotaxis would probably be the next run after that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's and, your thought on Tesla Energy? Yeah, At Tesla Energy. So record energy storage deployments of 2.1 gigawatt hours in Q3. That's a 62% year-over-year growth. So this seems to be something that's finally starting to take legs. When does it? When is it enough revenue that A, it becomes material, and B, somehow it's so big and such a big number that people start realizing, okay, this is not just a car company anymore. Like yeah. let's say 10% of their revenue. When do we get there? I mean, we saw record revenue was 1.1 billion this quarter, but what was interesting was it was also profitable finally and had almost like $100, $100 million of actual gross profit, which mm. is which is the big deal because before they were using 2170 sales and now switching to LFP sales has made that much difference. And then they were saying, was it, 
100 or 200 percent growth annually they expect 200 percent yeah but i um i think that um this new factory in uh, in california they're building for the megapax the, the capacity there is is 40 gigawatt hours a year yeah so yeah. that is when it starts to get exciting and this this they, they broke ground on this september last year so they surely yeah, yeah yeah surely surely it's got to be uh got to be close to, to finish now right so oh, no, then... it's already finished. Oh, the factory is It's already is that... launched. So this is, this is what oh. happened. You know, I, do you know that I create these milestone lists? Oh, right. Yes, uh, yes. I have seen those. Yes, yes. I do. <laughs> and I, have, I had this one milestone. Mm. And then one day I was talking to Omar about it. And I said, yeah, I'm just waiting to hear one day, you know, they broke ground on in September of last year already. They must He goes, oh, no. In the Q2 earnings report, if you open up and read it carefully, they announced that it's already live and running. Ooh. And I'm like... Like they did this like without making an announcement. <laughs> they just wow. like it was just in that earnings report. So it's live and running already, and that's <laughs> it's happening. Oh, right. Okay. So they just need more of these sales then. <laughs> and uh well, because the 40 gigawatt hours, I mean that's gonna be obviously 10 gigawatt hours a quarter, which is a big jump. And I would say if it's being manufactured on these lines, it's gonna be more profitable again. So I'm hoping for about 25, 30% margin. Um, so yeah, like your, your initial question, I think we'd get to about a billion dollars gross profit when that factory is ramped, hopefully, I don't know, sometime next year, which, you know, okay, it's not, it's not massive compared to the cars, but there's still extra billion dollars gross profit every quarter, which is noticeable. And, uh, but then, you know, we don't really hear much about energy. We don't get told much about it. And you know, it's, it's hard to, to speculate on where, where they're going. There's no... They haven't announced any of their own LFP in-house sales or what they want to do for energy cell wise So it's well, it's hard to try and try and find the uh, the future yeah. for that. Also, master plan part three. Mm, they'll make yeah. that announcement. Hopefully, he'll do it this year or you know several months this quarter. And it's more most likely going to be batteries and minerals and and it's going to fund energy. It's going to fund <laughs> Tesla energy, <clears throat> not just the batteries for the cars. And this is where we're going to hear battery factories. Um, but yeah, yeah it's, it's, you know, we hear all these utilities all over in all these different countries that's already showing, you know, success. Like the most recent one we all heard was Hawaii, hmm. now no longer needing to bring in any oil anymore. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. That's um, and and the, the, like, the original big one they had in, in South Australia as well, and it, it paid for itself in 18 months or two years. It's yeah. an incredible return on investment. So energy as a, as a business uh, investment for anyone, it's like, it's a return on investment. It saves you 30% every year on your, on your fuel or, or, or energy cost or 50%, whatever, whatever the return is, even if it's 15 or 20%, that's still a good return. It's better than you get in the bank. And the same will be for power walls for people's homes eventually. I, the price of those will come down a lot. They're gonna go to LFP eventually. Um, but uh, I, I think they should be at 5,000, oh, uh, how many US dollars? I know, two or 3,000 US dollars eventually perhaps. Um, what? Maybe yeah, maybe for about, like... for about ten kilowatt hours. It's got it's got to be if you want to go. Mention. Remember, you, you know, this is really it's really got to be the the developing nations need this more than anything if you want to make a change in the most environmental impact. Because you know they were using diesel generators. They should be on solar and battery, and that'll that'll have a, have a lot more impact. Plus, it costs a lot more for them to use diesel than it does for, for us using our electricity. Um, so I think that's really the the target market to have the most impact on the mission. And uh, the best return for those those people too, so I think that's inevitably where we go. Or of course they just have might just have mega packs there as well and solar from Tesla, which is also something I wonder. Like how we say Tesla may not sell robo taxis, well eventually they may also have their own mega packs and solar farms as well, and and just sell energy and and use that. You know, I've been predicting that, and I'm sure a lot of us are, have been. He's sure. just, he said all the time, 100 square miles yeah. is also needed to power the entire world. And so he would buy up land in Texas if he hadn't already and just do it and sell the energy to everybody. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's cover a little bit of your, uh, some of your videos that I saw recently that I was really okay. intrigued with. So you had several of them and you can choose which one you want to talk about. But, you know, we just got excited with all the things we've just said about, and you've got some really good videos on why isn't everyone investing in Tesla? Is Tesla a good investment for you? What did you think the stock price is going to be from a year from now? And then can Tesla's earnings beat a recession? So these are just the ones I looked at. What's your, uh, yeah, what can you share with us? 
Well, <clears throat> I think um, a lot of people are telling me now that, you know, it's all the macros and forget about Tesla. It's going to be flat now for ages or stay around 200 mm -hmm. or 250. You know, a lot of other people are saying, oh, it's going to go down to 150. But I, I mean, we've been hearing this rhetoric for however long, you know, even before the split, I had people telling me it's going to go down to 100 or 200, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, which would be like 60 now or something. But um, so I, but I, I, I'm of the belief that eventually, you know, especially with this operating leverage, it's just the, the, the profits are just going to get so fat, you know, and, and you can't ignore them, especially with the 4680 ramp and, uh, and the margins that you're going to see on those Model Ys, especially with the IRA on top of that and the battery subsidies, you, you can't ignore these financials, even in a recession, uh, when you see this much growth in profit so quickly, I just think it's you can't ignore it, you know. Even even if you suppress the P ratio down to thirty or forty, it's still going to be a big number. Yeah. Can I pause for a second? Interrupt you. You are the one that quoted the term. They can suppress the PE, <laughs> but they can't suppress the E. Yeah. And then you tweeted that out, and I said, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to own it. Is that okay, Lee? And you said, yes. So that becomes my thing now. Yeah. I love that quote. They can suppress the PE, but they can't suppress the E. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> you know, consumers, at the end of the day, are, gonna, are in charge with those dollars. They get to vote where those dollars go, and if it's Tesla's they want... And like we said, even in even in the peak of the global financial crisis, there were still 10, 11 million uh, vehicle sales in the U.S. So um, that that's you know, Tesla wouldn't even be making close to that many uh, in the recession. We might get up to a two million a year run rate in the U.S. end of next year, and by the time you know we'll be quick out of the recession soon enough. By the time their numbers actually get any higher, plus all the backlog they got for the Cybertruck anyway. And I'm I'm still of this theory that this new Model Y is also software locked on range and it might have the $60,000 entry point, but it might go up to $75,000 when you unlock it to something like ridiculous, like 400 miles of range. So, um, and then when you add FSD into that as well, you're up to $90,000 and then the margins start to just get ridiculous. <laughs> okay. So why isn't everyone investing in Tesla then? Um, it's a good question. I mean, uh, I try and convince them as much as I can, but, um, yeah, I, I, what, are, what is it that's putting them off? I, it's too hard to believe, perhaps, I, or, or they think it's overvalued and they look at that P ratio, but they don't understand the P ratio is is trailing twelve months, and like mm -hmm. a lot has happened in this with this company over the last twelve months. A a cross section of the P ratio relative to earnings that we just had, I think, is like forty five or something. Is it fifty? That's uh, which is which is a much more believable P ratio for most investors, you know. Um, I think it might be even lower, but, and then now with this epic Q4 coming up, I mean, if we're at the same, same, same stock price we have now, we're going to end up with a PE ratio relative to that Q4, if you analyze it, something like 30 or 35. <laughs> I think, I don't even think Tesla should have a PE ratio as low as 30, even when it's a mature yeah. company at around 20 million units a year. So I, yeah, I don't so know, it's insane. What's your stock price? Um, and I know you, you did this video before a lot of things happened in the last three weeks. So stock price a year from now, did you change your estimates? Where, where are you at? Well, I've been saying that um, I think as soon as the 4680 sales start hit high volume production, we should see mm -hmm. a stock price of $1,000 at least in two years from then. From then. Okay. From, so from maybe two and a half years from now, three, let's say three years from now. Perhaps, but I, hopefully, you know, they were spent, supposed to hit high volume production this quarter, I think from Q2, perhaps that was the last mm -hmm. week we were told that in the Q2 earnings. Yeah. So, you know, any day now <laughs> it might be Q1, Q2, and, and, and it might, might even, might not even be two years. It might be less than two years. Um, but like I was also saying that Cybertruck pivotal point as well, is probably going to give us a boost, maybe up to $600 or something. And then, yeah. then it starts ramping up more and it just keeps on charging up for another six, 12 months. And then it hits this thousand dollar price. And by that stage, uh, we should see the end of the back of the recession at least and into the recovery period of the market. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think, um, what we all need to do, me, what I need to do is just close my eyes, try to survive in the next six months, maybe <laughs> a year, open my eyes two years from now, three years from now, regardless of what happens, even if there's a recession, um, even the macro continues, 
I think that the stock price has to rise mm -hmm. to double or triple where we're at today. Mm -hmm. It can't be a 200. It's not going to be a 300. And for all the things you just said. So yeah. the earnings is going to continue to grow. <clears throat> even if we miss earnings estimates, even if we don't hit the 50% growth, you can't stop the... <laughs> Like that's why that's why it's shocking that people are going. Oh, you didn't hit the twenty-two billion dollars estimate, and you only hit twenty-one point five billion. Yeah. And so let's <laughs> cut the price of the stock by thirty dollars yeah. or something. It's like, okay, you guys are missing the big picture here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just got twenty-one billion dollars of revenue profitably. Yeah. yeah, and you know, end of last year we were at four hundred and twenty stock price adjusted for split. Um, that's. A year ago, almost. Uh, it was this. It was almost two years ago when we were at this current price. I think December twenty twenty. Yeah. Uh, and look what has happened over the last two years. You know, it's yeah. like, like this is insane. That it's the same stock price. So, yeah, I, I, the the market is. You know, it, it gets crazy. It doesn't understand. It's not forward looking as much as this. And we are also in our own little echo chambers. And yeah. we we think expect everyone else to know what we know and understand it to our level. Maybe it's our personality type as well. We're all these kind of people who can just, we just get it. We understand it mm -hmm. better than everyone. And we all click so well and agree with each other. Um, and we just don't understand what, what everyone else is missing. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you for spending time with me this hour and a bit. Sure. Um, I certainly learned a lot. You know your stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lee. Everyone, Thanks, you've got to follow him on YouTube at Tesla Economist. Um, great, uh, Wonderful. I, I love watching his videos, actually. He's very, very good. He's also on Twitter at Tesla Economist. And um, hope you felt got a little brighter today. And I think you did. And if you mm -hmm. did, please uh, do a, a like and share. And um, tell me in the, in, the, um, in the comments what you thought and what, what you heard in the earnings call that got you most excited and you thought was most important. Lee said it was the batteries. I love he did that because that mm -hmm. wasn't my answer, but he reminded <laughs> me it should have been my answer. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Great. Thanks, Herbert. Take care.